If there is no death, there is no resurrection. If there is no crucifixion, there is no resurrection. And that chapter happens to be in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In quite a few Bibles, the heading given to that chapter is the resurrection of Christ. In it, Paul, Saint Paul, in verse 3 he says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Verse 4, was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Verse 14, he said, if Christ is not risen from the dead, our preaching is vain, your faith is vain. That's what he's telling the other Christians. That means we have nothing. If this thing didn't happen, that Christ died and he was resurrected, then everything is hot air, wind. The American would say garbage. Everything is garbage if this thing didn't happen. <laughs> then in verse number 35, Paul poses the question. He poses the rhetoric question. He's not asking you or me. He said, someone may rationally ask, how do the dead rise again? And, what, and with what kind of body will they come? And in verse 42, he answers. He answers his own question. Verse 43 of the same chapter. See, so it is sown, the dead body, it is sown, it is buried, it is sown in dishonor, and it is raised in glory. It is sown, means buried, the dead body, it is sown in weakness, and it is raised in power. Yuzra'u jisman hayawaniyan wa yuqamu jisman ruhaniyan. And it is sown, buried, a physical body, and it is raised a spiritual body. I would like to know if there's anybody here, you know, who needs a dictionary to understand that. It is sown, buried, a physical body, and it is raised a spiritual body. I'm asking, do you need a dictionary for that? Do you need a DD for that or a DDAT for that to explain to you? No. Simple statement. King's English or Queen's English from the authorized King James Version. Now, what Paul says about this resurrection, that it will be a spiritual body, He's only confirming what Jesus Christ had already said to his disciples, to the Jews. But Paul didn't have it before him because he was about the first person to start writing these epistles of his. And he wrote 14 different epistles, 14 different books of the New Testament, more than 50%. He didn't know. He didn't hear. He didn't read. But Jesus Christ had said the very same thing. We read that in the Gospel of St. Luke, St. Luke chapter 20, verse 36. The Jews came to Jesus. They were always coming to him with poses and riddles. They were trying to test him out, make a fool of him. Master, must we pay tribute to Caesar or not? Master, this woman we found her in the, caught her in the act. What must we do to her? Master this and master that. They were always trying to put him to the test. Now they come to him with another riddle. A poser. Said master, rabbi in the Hebrew language, there was a woman among us. And that woman had seven husbands. According to a Jewish practice. If one brother died, and if he le leave, left no offspring, then the second brother takes her to wife. And when he fails, the third. And when he fails, the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh. Seven guys had this one woman. But there was no problem. Because it was all one by one. Now they are asking Jesus that at the resurrection, which guy is going to have her? Because they all had her here. So if you have her here, you want to have her there. That's the picture they're giving Jesus. Which guy is going to have her on the other side? Because seven guys will 
wake up simultaneously, all seven, one time. And when they wake up one time, they see this woman, everybody say, my wife, my dear, my darling, and there'll be a war in heaven between the seven brothers. Say, get away, it's mine. The other guy say, get away, it's mine. There'll be war in heaven between the seven brothers. So they want to know from Jesus, which guy is going to have her on the other side. In answer to that, Jesus says, neither shall they die anymore. Meaning, once they are resurrected, they will be immortalized. This is a mortal body which has got its mortal needs. Food, shelter, clothing, sex, rest. Without these things, no Englishman left, no Pakistani left, no American left. Finish. So that body will be an immortal body. No food, no shelter, no clothing, no sex, no rest of the type that we know. For they are equal unto the angels. For they are equal unto the angels. Meaning that they will be angelized. They will be spiritualized. They will be spiritual creatures. They will be spirits. For they are equal unto the angels and the children of God. For such are the children of the resurrection. Such spirits. Luke chapter 20 verse 36. Paul says that the resurrected bodies will be spirits. Jesus says the resurrected bodies will be spirits. I say the resurrected bodies will be spirits. I want to find a single dissenting voice here in this great hall to say that they believe that the resurrected bodies will not be spiritualized. It will be physical resurrection. Before I proceed, I want to get 100% acceptance from each and every one of you that the resurrection will be spiritual as Paul says, it will be spiritual as Jesus says. Not this body. You all agree? Is there any dissenting voice? Yes? What do you say? Right. I will answer that. So we go to that upper room. As our brother has quoted. That's Luke chapter 24 verse 36. See Jesus walks into that upper room. According to the scriptures. I'm only reading the Bible. What it says. I'm not reading the Quran. I don't say the Quran says this. The Quran says that. Or you know some Imam Ghazali said such and such a thing. Now, our brother quoted scripture. He quoted Luke chapter 24, verse 36. So I said, let's go to that. To satisfy him. That the resurrected bodies is just the exact opposite what Paul said. What Jesus is telling you there is exact opposite. It's exact opposite of what Jesus told you. You see, Jesus walks into that upper room where they had the last supper after his alleged crucifixion. And he goes in and he wishes his disciples Shalom Alaikum in Hebrew. In Arabic, Salam Alaikum. In English, peace be unto you. When he said peace be unto you, his disciples were terrified. So I'm asking, why were they terrified? Because when you meet your long lost master, your uncle, your grandfather, the Arab and the Jew, you might have seen some of us performing, you know, we embrace one another, we kiss one another. The Jews did the same. So instead of embracing Jesus and kissing him as the Jews and the Arabs do, they were terrified. I want to know why were they terrified? It's very unusual. When you meet your master, your ustad, your guru, whatever it is, why should you be terrified? So Luke tells us that they were affrighted because they thought he was a spirit. I'm only quoting. They thought he was a spirit. They thought. So I'm asking. Did he look like a spirit? Did he look like a spirit? And in 40 years, no Christian worth the name has told me yes. Not one. I said, did he look like a spirit? This is no. I said, why should they think the man is a spirit when he didn't look like a spirit? You will have your time at question time. At question time, you'll be given the opportunity. Uh, did you see Brother Dalal's uh, 
They were not there. They were not eyewitnesses or your witnesses to the happenings. All, I'm asking the English man, does all mean all in your language? He said, yes. I asked the Zulu in my country, does Bonke mean Bonke in your language? He said, yes. I said, you Africana, does Almal mean Almal in your language? He said, yes. Does Kulli mean Kulli in your language, you Arab? He said, yes. He said, they were not there. That's what Mark tells us. So, because their knowledge was from hearsay, they had heard about a man dead and buried for three days. They expect him to be stinking in his grave. So when you see such a man, naturally you are terrified. So Jesus wants to assure them that is not what they are thinking. They are thinking he's come back from the dead, resurrected. So he says, Unzuru ila yadaya varijalaya. He says, Behold my hands and my feet. Inni anahua. That it is I myself and the same fellow man, damn fools, what are you afraid of him for? Husuni wanzuru, handle me and see. For inna ruha laysa lahu lahmu wa izamu. For a spirit has no flesh and bones, as you see me have. And they felt him, and they believed not for joy. I'm only reading. And they believed not for joy, means that they were overjoyed and wondered. What happened, man? We thought the man was dead and buried. So he says, Aindakum hahuna ta'am. Have you here anything to eat? Fanawaluhu juz'am min samakin wa shay'an min shahadi asalin fa akhaza wa akala kuddam. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb and he took it and he ate in the very sight. To prove what? That he's resurrected? To prove that you got flesh and bones, you eat food, what is he proving? That he said, May, anywhere a man chose to look, he could find evidence of God's supreme power and intelligence. But men refused to recognize God or give him credit. Rather, they chose to believe that the demons in rocks and trees had power over the universe. With their own hands, they made images of all kinds of things in the hope that the uh, powers in these images would give to their owners the means of controlling the world to their own purposes. Since man rejected the knowledge of the God of heaven, God withdrew the light of reason from these people. And men became creatures enslaved to vile passions, interested only in working something shameful and disgraceful to their own bodies. To such a world, in the reign of the Roman Caesar Tiberius, Jesus came preaching. The uh, now 30 years of age, Jesus came to his home province of Galilee, preaching in the Hebrew synagogues and declaring to all who would listen that the kingdom of God had arrived and men should now repent and believe the gospel. 
The gospel as defined by the Bible is the good news that God does not want any person to be lost but to, for all to come to the knowledge of the truth. And that God loved man, he did not hate man, but God loved man. And so he was going to provide a way for man to be rescued from his own destruction. If this was going to happen, men, however, were going to have to change their mind because they were possessed with this idea that there was no deity really in charge but the devils themselves. And uh, they had to placate those devils somehow if they would survive in this world. And so Jesus had to demonstrate, not just by word but by his life, that God is still in charge, God is still in control, and God intends that man have the power to overcome Satan and be the victor in this world and in this life. Now to do that, of course, he had to counter the lies of the, the wise people of the day and tell men the truth, even as we have that problem today. And surely we can join in that effort to convince the world of our time that this world did not just happen, it just did not come by some sort of uh, easy process, but that God is the creator and sustainer of our universe, and to him we will all one day give an account. John says in the preface of his gospel, grace and truth became, came into being, arrived for the first time by Jesus Christ. Those are important statements. Up until Jesus came, nobody gave anybody favor. It was thought to be cowardice. It was thought to be almost criminal to be kind or forgiving to anyone. It was a case of a uh, every man for himself, and the devil take the hindmost. But Jesus came to explain about God's grace and to show how that grace could redeem man from the miseries into which he had fallen. But of course he had to tell the truth, the truth about God and his world and about man and all the things that he was needing. To gain attention, he had to demonstrate that he himself uh, had the power of God. And so, as you know and as you believe, he performed all sorts of miracles that still has the world talking. He multiplied, for instance, the boys' lunch and fed 5,000 men besides women and children. He stilled the storm by command, and the wind stopped, and the waves were quieted. He healed the sick. It didn't matter how badly sick. He restored lepers to health. He gave sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, raised the dead, and all these things. He was trying to tell us that God is good. He's not bad. He's not a devil of some kind interested in destroying us all. God is good. And God is wanting to prepare a good world for us. Not only here, but in the world to come. On one occasion, as you may know if you've read the gospel, Jesus brought a man back to life who had been dead four days. The Jews did not embalm. They buried, therefore, ordinarily the same day by winding the body with the cloth and uh, uh, putting in whatever spices they could afford. On the occasion that we read in John 11 about this work of Christ, uh, Jesus' friends, Mary and Martha, had sent word to him that his friend Lazarus, their brother, was sick. But the servants could not locate Jesus right away, and by the time he arrived, Lazarus was in the tomb four days already. 
Jesus asked the girls to take him out to the burial place, and they did with many of the townspeople following. At the tomb site, he asked the sisters to have the stone removed, and they objected, saying, He's dead already. There will be bad odor. But Jesus insisted, and they moved the stone. Then standing there with the odors coming out of the dead body from within, Jesus uh, 